Okay, this morning uh, we're continuing in our series on the book of 1 Peter, and just by way of background uh, to those who may have uh, not been here before for some of our messages, uh, 1 Peter is a letter it was written by, and very clearly written by, the Apostle Peter in about 63 or 64 CE, the Common Era, that was sent to a group of Jewish believers. This letter was sent to a group of Jewish believers that were scattered through northern Turkey from pretty much east to west. And uh, the goal was to instruct them in this letter on how to maintain a righteous living in an unrighteous world. That's really what Peter's message is all about. And last week, we completed, as you know, chapter 2, and uh, I titled the message last week, Lifestyle Evangelism, but there's more to it. No matter how much it hurts, and, you know, living for the Lord can be a dangerous thing. In those days, they encountered an awful lot of persecution for their faith. Just to remind you of the, uh, of that, the end of uh, chapter 2, actually there are 25 verses, but from verse 12 of chapter 2, just remind you of what Peter said about lifestyle evangelism, living so that people see your lives in a way that reflects your faith and they know that there is something different about you. Verse 12, be careful, Peter wrote, to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he comes and judges the world. Maybe they'll even give honor sooner than that. But you live for that. That's what Peter was calling these people to do. It hasn't changed. The message continues. This week, we are going to pick up uh, in chapter 3 and cover the first thir uh, 12 verses in chapter 3. And I'm going to go, uh, since we have so much to cover, I'm going to take them uh, as, we, as we go. Um, the first part of the first verse says this, in the same way, you wives, any of you wives out there, but you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. I know it's sometimes tough to hear some of these things, right? Especially the husbands that we got here, but we won't talk about that, right? We'll get to them in a moment. It, it starts out by saying, in the same way. When he says this in the same way, what is he referring to? He's referring to the same, the spirit of, of, def, of deferring deference and humble submission that he's already talked about back in just a few verses earlier in chapter 2, verse 21, when he said this, Peter did, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Messiah suffered for you. You see, he is your example and you must follow in his steps. He was willing to suffer for the faith, suffering for you and me. We can do no less. Now, in the same way, you wives, and at this point, Peter is going to deal with two types of husbands for these married women. That's why he talks about you wives, those are people, ladies who are married, and he's, there are two types he's going to deal with. Believing husbands, women who have husbands who are believers, and also women who have husbands who are not believers yet. I like to call them, uh, you know, pre-believers, but uh, actually they're not believers at this point, so they fall into both categories. But uh, to the believing husbands, Peter said, Accept the, uh, accept the authority given by God to husbands in marriage. That's what he says. Wives, you must accept the authority of your husbands. Now, why does he say that? Why don't the husbands accept the leadership of the wives? 
If you, if you were asked that question, how would you answer it? Say, well, it's supposed to be a joint thing, you know. Uh, you know we'll work together and uh, we'll decide as a team. Uh, apparently, that's not the way God planned it. You see, you can find many verses in, in the Scripture to support this. And I just picked this one out from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. He says, Paul wrote, For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. There was a sequence in which God established humanity. This is God's structure of humanity that He created. And He did that so that peace and order might prevail in marriages. How's that working out? Yeah, well, we have some issues, huh? Anybody who's married knows that there are issues. Sometimes we make it through the issues, and sometimes the uh, issues overwhelm us. But this is the intent that God had. This was his intent. Now, for women who have unbelieving husbands, those who are not yet in the faith, he wrote, continuing in, actually in verse 1, then even if some, meaning unbelieving husbands, refuse to obey the good news, just shoot them. <laughs> oh, and I don't think he, that's in there, no. No, he said, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. That implies, women, that your lives are godly. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Men, do you have wives who are living pure and reverently? I don't see too many hands here. We have one, Pastor Randy's here. Thank God he's got a wife that's supportive, and I know, understand that. But uh, some others, I see some other hands going up. Thank God for that, too. That's because the women are right here. So. They will be won over by their, your wives who are pure and reverent in their living. See, that's where a lifestyle evangelism comes in. By, their, by the way you lead your life, you are impacting others, whether you realize it and want to or not. It really does. So how you, you, know, how you work your life, what you do and what you don't do, people are watching more than you know. If you have children, which is not being addressed in this passage, it's uh, addressed elsewhere, but not right here, they are really watching. It doesn't matter what you say, by the way, when you have children. It's what you do. They can tell what your, well, your, your actions really match your words. So, lifestyle evangelism. We're all called to participate in that. And now Peter instructs the wives how to live this pure and reverent lifestyle. In verse 3, he says, Don't be concerned, ladies, about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. <laughs> they didn't have credit cards in those days, did they? But apparently, uh, it was not uncommon for them to, be, look, to, to get involved with these things, and uh, uh, that was not always good. Don't be concerned with them, he says. He says see, Peter, it's interesting because Peter mentions this here, but it's not the first time that you've probably heard about it. It's not the only place you're going to hear about it in Scripture. Do you remember Paul? We, uh, we've done some of his, uh, you know, First and Second Corinthians and a few other uh, writings of Paul. Paul also discussed issues of modest dress for women. He really did. This is a common problem. It still persists. First Timothy, Paul wrote, And I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or 
as we call it in New York, poils or expensive clothes. They're not supposed to dress to attract in that way. Peter says, you should clothe yourselves, ladies, instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. That is what God desires. He, see, he doesn't look at the outside of people. He looks at the inside. He knows the hearts. And you know, others see your hearts too. And it's precious to God. And it's a precious thing to husbands as well. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. Did you know who the holy women of old were? Yeah. Well, Sarah was certainly one of them. You're going to see that in a moment. Because these, these holy women trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, he goes on, Peter does, Sarah, she obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him master. <laughs> Men, raise your hand if your wife has called you master. Or anything. <laughs> Not so much. Uh, yeah. In case you want to, though, I uh, just want to share with you. Here's, here's the word for it. Uh, Adoni means uh, my master. If you want to address your husbands, Adoni, my master, what shall I do next? How can I please you? Chocolate cake will do. No, so Sarah obeyed her husband and called him master. There's a verse uh, in Genesis eighteen twelve where that happens and other places where Sarah did that. And uh, Peter goes on to say, you are her, Sarah's daughters, when or if you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. You better not be living in fear. You know, hopefully you don't have a husband that scares you. I hope not. There are such things. But if you do what's right, God will be pleased. Peter introduces Sarah here. See, she's the, the wife of the famed patriarch, Abraham. My goodness. You get to get a look at an example. And he does this to underscore the long history of what Scripture presents as models of godly behavior. Sarah did what Abraham commanded her, asked her to do. And she was blessed because of it. So did many of the other leaders in Scripture, women who listen to their husbands. Now, okay, now after dealing with wives, it's your turn, men. Verse 7, oh, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. You know, I looked at this and uh, when I was, I was studying this passage, it occurred to me, I looked and I counted here, there are six verses that Peter has written for guidance for the wives and only one verse for the men thought about that. Really? Why did Peter write so much to the wives and so little to the husbands? I, I, I actually pondered that for a while. I did some research on that. And I concluded that evidently Peter was more concerned about believing wives who were married to pagan husbands he was more concerned with those, that situation where wives who are believers are married to husbands who are not because he was more concerned with those than he was with the other way around, that is, believing husbands who were married to pagan women. 
in that culture, believing wives were in a much more vulnerable position than believing husbands, turns out. Well, maybe it's true today as well. I came across an article on one of the commentaries by a gentleman named Peter Davids, who's the author of the uh, uh, New International Commentary on the New Testament, the NICNT uh, version of uh, a commentary on First Peter, First Epistle of Peter. And, uh, and Peter David said, it is clear that Peter did not worry so much about the possibility of a husband with a non-believing wife. He didn't worry so much about that. Well, why not? For in those days, if a family head, like the husband, in that culture changed his religion, it would be normal that his wife sir, and servants and children also changed. They went along with the head of the family. So naturally, Peter wasn't as worried about that because even if the wives were not believers, maybe they, uh, uh, they intentionally placed their faith in what their husband believed. And there wasn't any problem if, that, if that's really happened, but you wonder about it. But apparently, this was not uncommon in those days. But there's one more thing that I came across, and I, I found it very interesting here. It's easy to overlook the profound significance of the instruction that Peter gave right here when he says, understand, uh, live with your wives in an understanding way and, 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 and show honor to her. According to uh, J.R. Slaughter, who uh, wrote uh, for the Bibsac uh, an article called The Importance of Literary Argument for Understanding First Peter, this instruction, verse 7 that you see here, this instruction about husbands, understand and honor your wives, this required active listening on the, uh, to, the, to the wife as well as a study, a, a careful study of her temperament, emotions, personality, and thought patterns. And you know, he said, it, it is a tall order to understand one's wife. Women take a lot of work, men, in case you haven't noticed. They're complex. To understand them and to honor them takes effort on your part. Peter got it. Here we are 2,000 years later. Men, just a warning, a wake-up call. Your wife is complex. Probably more than you are. They have different gifts. Definitely different gifts. Did you know, did you know that physiologically men are different from women as far as their brains are concerned? That the left half and the right half have more connections in the uh, brain of women than there are in the brains of men. And scientists who have, psychologists who have studied these things have concluded that that's the reason that women can do two things at once, and men can't. I know, I see some heads shaking. Saying, yeah, yeah. See, women can, they can be, I don't know, cooking, say, or, or even writing, and they could be listening to you at the same time. As I get frustrated when I try to talk to my wife, and she's doing something else. And she'll say, yeah, 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 and I'll, you know, I'll be going, I'll say, but Bonnie, pay attention here, I'm talking. And, and she says, I'm listening, but you're not looking at me, you're not paying attention. I can listen. And then she doesn't understand that I can't do that. So if I'm doing one thing, she walks over and starts talking, and then she wonders why I didn't get the beginning of her sentence. <laughs> I told her, I said, you know, if it's important, Use my name. Doug, are you there? You got a minute? I got to say something. 
Listen up. She doesn't do that enough. It causes issues. She thinks I don't, I have a hearing problem. That might be true too. As the years are going by. Although that's actually a value you'll find in that, you know, you're not hearing so much, you know, say the men, men. But seriously, women, if, if you're having communication problems with your men, get their attention before you start talking too much about it, whatever it is you want to say. They will get it if their attention is on you. They're very good and very focused, can be extremely focused on an issue, but not if their attention is not there. They can't do that while they're you know, writing notes or uh, doing a, you know, working on a project. They, so just a word of, uh, of advice here about men and women. No, no extra charge on that one. Oh, it does work that way. I know. I, I am one. Peter says she may not be, uh, she may be someone who's weaker since she is a woman, but Peter was never implying that women were inferior to men. He, he is not saying that. God did not say that. While the wife may indeed be physically weaker, she may also be emotionally, socially, intellectually, and or spiritually stronger. Women have great insight, sometimes spiritually. Just like you, men. In fact, Peter underscored, in this case, he underscored the equality of husbands and wives in this very text by calling her a fellow heir of the grace of life. A fellow heir of the grace of life. I thought about that. Shouldn't he call her a, a fellow? Uh, has the plural, is there a female form of fellow? I don't know. But whatever it is. She is a joint heir of the grace of life with you. So God must see her as, as an equal in life. Now, likely here, when Peter uses fellow heir, he's uh, thinking of the most amazing grace gift that was ever given, the gift of eternal life. That's what he must have in mind, Peter does. So based on the instructions that Peter gave in these first seven verses, now, beginning in verse 8, he, he summarizes how believers should live in community. How should they live now that they have the instructions? Listen carefully. Finally, all of you, this applies to each one of us as well, the things that Peter is, is about to share. All of you should be of one mind. This is a Jewish congregation, Rob. I don't know how that's possible, I'm telling you. That's a tall order right there. You've heard the phrase, you know, you have uh, two Jews, you've got three opinions. One mind. Sympathize with each other. That implies you also communicate with each other. Because you can't sympathize if you don't know what somebody else is going through. And if they're not willing to share it, then you've got no chance of understanding what they're going through. It's one of the reasons we have a, uh, an online prayer ministry. That if you need prayer, you can share it with others who will sympathize with your needs and pray for you. That's a good way to connect. It's, it's very easy. You just have to email uh, Belinda at uh, prayer at bendavidmjc.org. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. I thought about this one. I've raised children, seen how brothers and sisters work. When they're growing up, there are problems that happen. And brothers and sisters don't always see eye, eye to eye on things as they grow up. And I said, gosh, if that's the example, my gosh, this is, uh, you know, not going to be very uh, harm harmonious. 
love each other as brothers and sisters. But what he's talking about here, the, obviously the brothers and sisters are not the little children. He's talking about other believers or adults. And hopefully they've grown up. Some I'm not so sure. Be tenderhearted. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. If you've had another brother or sister do something to you that has really upset you, don't, re don't turn around and do something back. Extend love and forgiveness. Call that person. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. That's hard for me to do because, you know, somebody has, uh, says things that are untrue, I immediately want to respond. I have to work on that. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, this is even harder. Pay them back with a blessing. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had somebody mistreat you and you've turned around and said, you know, I'm going to do something for them? It's hard to do. That's what you're being called to do. This is, nobody said when you come to f in this faith, it's going to be easy. You know, people think that... Uh, They've got, uh, they come here, they pl they've said the sinner's prayer, they're in God's kingdom, they've got fire insurance, you know. Uh, it doesn't work that way, it's only the beginning. God is going to work you over. He's going to make you daily, if he can, more and more like Yeshua. And I think we've all got a ways to go. We're still in process. Some of us, the process seems to be taking a little longer than others. Pay them back with a blessing. This is what God has called you to do, and he will bless you for it. How about that? You want to receive a blessing from God? Then do this. Put this into action. Try it. Try it this week. Verse 10. For the scriptures say... If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. Not an easy task. Remember, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. He's listening to people who listen to him. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Now, I have one closing question here for you. You read these verses here, 10 through 12? Do these instructions remind you of a song? Remind, it's very clear that Paul, uh, Peter was quoting thoughts from Psalm 34. Let us exalt his name together. I'd like to close our service with that song. If you would get the worship team back up here, if you would join me up here. Let's stand and we're going to close with singing the end of what Peter told us to do. It's a song that Stuart Darriman put to music. Let us exalt his name together. And think about these words as you're seeing them. It's a pretty song, but think about what God is telling us to do in, these, in this song. It's, very, it's, it's actually quite instructive. Let us exalt his name together. 
At all times I will bless him. His praise shall be in my mouth. My soul makes his boast in the Lord. A humble man will hear of it. The afflicted will be glad. And join with me to magnify the Lord. Love righteousness. 